pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that we can come before you. Lord, that we can learn from you, that we can grow in you, Lord. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would touch us, that you'd be moving in our life, that we would just grow in you, be strengthened in you, that we would come to know you more and more. Lord, just be working, Lord, in our midst and speaking to our hearts tonight. Lord, as we study your word, Lord, may you just guide us and direct us, convict us and change us, Lord. Mold us, Lord, into your image, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. How about, Lord, you're more precious than silver? Good. Okay. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares with you. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And nothing I desire compares with you. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Make me like you, Lord, oh, make me like you. You are a servant. Make me one too. Lord, I am willing to what you must do to make me like you, Lord. Make me like you. Make me like you, Lord. Oh, make me like you. You are a servant. Make me one too. Lord, I am willing to what you must do to make me like you, Lord, make me like you. Lord, that's the prayer of our heart, Lord God, that we become more and more like you, that we grow in your image, Lord Jesus, that you would just be working. And Holy Spirit, as we learn of the gifts that you give us, the ways that you work in our lives. Lord, we ask for you to work. We ask for you to transform us, Lord God, and to instill your gifts upon our lives, Lord God, that we may just serve one another and edify one another and build up the church, Lord God. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I'll make sure that I get the... I had them, but I didn't put them in my bag, but... Next week, I'll give you guys the new sheets with all the new songs on. The new really old songs. These songs are old. They're all new to you, yeah. That's the great thing, is that once they get old enough, you just bring them back, and everybody's like, wow, this is new. You're like, <laughs> yes, it is. All right. So as we continue our study in getting to know the Holy Spirit, we have looked at um, words of wisdom, we've looked at words of knowledge, we've looked at 
the gift of faith and healings and miracles and prophecy. And tonight we're going to look at the discerning of spirits. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 10, it says, To another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, different kinds of tongues, to another, interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing, distributing to each one individually as he wills. We're, tonight we're going to be looking at the discerning of spirits. And Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6. So turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Paul here is encouraging us to put on the full armor of God. And he reminds us that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, uh, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. One thing that we sometimes quickly forget is that there is a spiritual realm working around us, that there are things going on that we don't see. We get so uh, used to living here and now in the flesh, what we see, what we touch, And we can forget that there are other things at work. And that's why Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's a reminder to us that when we're we're in a struggle or in a battle with someone, that we need to take a step back and go, okay, there's something else going on here. And how many times have you guys had an experience where you go, wait a second, there's something else going on. You're in a difficulty, you're butting heads and you're going, this doesn't make sense. It's irrational. It doesn't make sense. And you're like, wait a second, there's something else. There is a spiritual battle going on. Now, we know that God's up in heaven, and we know that the angels are here working and serving and ministering and, and, and helping us out. But sometimes we forget about the other side, that there are the, the devil and his demons who are also working and fighting and battling amongst us. We get so used to what we can see, what we can feel, what we can touch, and we sometimes forget and are blind to the fact that there's other things going on around us. And it's important, and not not to freak us out, but to be aware of it. Be aware of it. And we know that the devil really has no power over me, because I stand with Jesus in victory. The only power he has is the power that I give him when I give in to his temptation, when I give in to his lies. And so we can stand in victory with the Lord But we have to be aware of this battle that's going on because it affects other people around us. And so the the gift of discerning of spirits is this gift of understanding. It's a understanding. It's a, um, a check in our spirit that says something's not right. Something's askew. Now, we I, I don't know if you guys have heard this illustration, but in this room right now, there are a bunch of signals floating around that we can't see and that we're completely oblivious of. We've got the Wi-Fi. We've got radio signals. We've got all kinds of things that are floating through the air or cellular signals. All of this stuff is happening. And we aren't aware of it unless we are tuned into it. Unless we're tuned into it, we have no ideas. It's kind of like, uh, you guys remember the day when they took away our TV? Where they took away the ability to just put your antennas up and find your CBC and I miss those rabbit ears. I remember standing there going, okay, hold on. I remember one time we were 
trying to get the signal in the cabin and I had wires hooked up to the the um, curtain rods and everything trying to find something just pick up some signal it's not working it looked like some mad scientist trying to make something work and we finally just gave up it's just like oh forget it because anyways by the time we got it working all we got was hockey and figure skating we just went <laughs> you know I come home from work you're like I don't want to watch this but there are these signals floating around, but we won't. We don't even notice them or pay attention unless we are tuned into them, unless we have something to tune in. I rem remember those walkie-talkies I bought at the beginning of COVID when we were doing the walks. Well, one of the time after one of the Sundays, I took them, I put them in the box, and I had some charging, and I had put them all in a box and put them up on my shelf. So that week, I'm sitting there studying in my office, quietly reading, and I hear. <laughs> And I thought there was someone outside, so I go look outside, nobody there. Because sometimes Kevin, when he comes, he'll see him and he'll knock or make noises. To, yeah. Um, try to scare me or something, though. Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether to knock on that floor or the other one. Or the other one, yeah. Um, so I'm like, what? What's, where? I'm hearing voices. So I thought someone is outside, no one's outside. And then I sit down again. And I, I'm like, what? So I'm, I get up and start walking around the garage, and then I walk over, and I've got this Tupperware container that's got all the things in it, and there's voices coming out of it. <laughs> and, so I, and I open it up, and you could hear, you know, once I opened it, I could hear what was going on. And it was delivery drivers, you know, it was uh, delivering Amazon or whatever, and they're talking with their dispatch, and it was picking it up. And so I'm just like, okay, so obviously some of them aren't turned off, so I'm going through this entire thing, turning them all, going to make sure they're all off. But, you know, because I was tuned in, I could hear the voice. I could hear what's going on. And that's what discerning of the spirit is. It's a gift that it's unique. It's a unique gift that lets you sense what's happening around you in the spiritual realm. This is often felt in a in discerning a person's spirit, just knowing that this person is either good or there's something not right here. There's something just not doesn't feel right. There's something wrong. Sometimes you get a feeling there's something dark here. There's something just not fitting. And it, I, I don't want to call it a gut feeling, but it is kind of that way. It is a feeling you get where you're just like, oh, you know, you meet someone and you go, you know, this is just not right. And I remember I met this one gentleman and everybody was going on about him. He was the greatest thing since sliced cheese. And you got to meet him. He's so nice and this. And I met him and I just thought, there's not something right here. And every time I ran into him, I was just like, there's not, there's something not right. And when people talked to me about him, I said, I don't know. And, uh, and then everything came out. And it was, I went, okay, I was right. There was something really bad going on. There was something really dark that was hidden, a secret. And when it came out, it was like, whoa. And so I'm, I'm thankful that I stayed away from him and didn't get involved with doing things with him because then I would have been caught in the in the crossfire. And so the discerning of spirits is a really beautiful gift to have because it can protect you from a lot of damage. It also can be a dif difficult gift because you may discern it, but someone else won't. And so they look at you and go, why are you being so cold? Why are you being so hesitant? Why aren't you jumping in on, you know, in this deal or whatever's going on or this thing? Why are you being so, you know, this way? And you're like, well, I just know that there's something wrong. I remember one time this guy, uh, one of the years ago, this guy brought a friend to church and he was all excited about this friend coming to church. And, and as soon as I saw him come in, my spirit went, okay, something's not right. And I remember because my dad came up to me and said, I don't feel right. There's something not right with this guy. And I said, yeah, I feel the same way. I'll talk to him after the service because he kind of came in and sat down as the service was starting. And after the service, I came up and I talked to him for a few minutes and then just said, okay, he, he was like, I need to go out for coffee with you this week. I said, we have coffee right now. Let's do it right now. He says, no, I need to talk to you alone this week. And I was like, no, what do you want? He had an agenda, and, I, and it was not a good agenda. And I, I, I talked to them, and then I said, see you later. But the other person who had brought him to church was very upset with me because they're like, you treated my friend rudely or whatever. Because you didn't go out for coffee, you know, you wouldn't. And I said, no, you don't understand. He had an agenda. What are you talking about? It's like, you know, they didn't even know. He was using his, this person, this guy, other guy from the church to get in to try to get stuff from me. And it's like, no, 
I'm sorry, that's not how it works. And so the discerning of spirit works that way. It's a check in your spirit that just says, hey, you know what? And sometimes the Lord will use two gifts at once because he'll give you a check in the spirit and he'll give you a word of knowledge where you go, okay, I know what's going on here. Like, I just know this is what you're here for. And, and the Lord will work that way. And so I think when we're talking about gifts of, gifts of the spirit, this is the one that I often pray, Lord, please give me discernment so that I'm able to lead the fellowship, and then I'm able to, to take care of the people and protect them. You know, um, the other part about it is when we ignore the discerning of spirits, when we have that check in our spirit and we ignore it. I remember years ago, I had a real check in my spirit, but I was so excited about the church growing, I ignored it with a certain family, and it did not go well. And I sat there year, a year later, or two years later, and thought I should have said something at the very beginning. I should have taken care of this right at the beginning because I knew there was something wrong. And I knew there was a, something happening. And so it's important for us to pay attention to it and to follow what the Lord is saying. The gift of discernment is also the ability to tell the difference between true and false doctrine. You get a check in your spirit and say, that don't sound right. That doesn't sound like the truth because I know the word. We begin to know the difference between what someone is saying and what the spirit is really saying. Philip, one of the seven deacons that was chosen in the, in the book of Acts, uh, I think in chapter 6 is where they were chosen, he went down to Samaria later on in his ministry and he preached the gospel in Samaria and a revival broke out. The Samaritans were getting saved right and left and the church in Jerusalem heard about it. Let's turn to Acts chapter 8. Look at that. Acts chapter 8, verse 9, we'll start. So there's a great revival happening in Samaria. And it says, But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was, he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is, great, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So we see this beautiful story. We see that the... Oh, the the uh, revival happened in Samaria, people are getting saved, they're getting excited, and even this sorcerer, this man who dabbled in the, in the dark arts here is now saved and been baptized and following along with Philip, and it's, it's an exciting story. But then it goes on, it says, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had not he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of uh, laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he he offered them money. He offered them money, saying, "Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit." But Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. You okay over there? You have neither part or portion in this matter. For your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness and pray. Pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. 
For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of the, none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So Peter and John come down. They see the revival. They see that these people have been saved and they're excited in the Lord. And they see that the Holy Spirit hasn't come upon them yet. And so they go and they lay hands upon them and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And Simon sees this and he says, ooh, ooh, that's a neat trick. I want that. Now we have to understand that from the beginning of time, magicians made their money by buying and selling tricks, illusions. How many of you guys have ever been to a magic store? How many, how many of you guys have ever bought a magic trick? They're expensive. They're expensive. They're a lot of fun, but they're expensive. They're, they're devices, they're tools, they're tricks, there's methods of doing things, they're illusions to trick people. And so they buy and sell them. If you're good at creating things, hey, you can make really good money in that industry. And so in his mind, he looks at it and says, hey, I can pay for that. Now, when we read the first part, we go, oh, he, he's just new in the faith. Maybe he didn't understand. Maybe he was confused. But then we see that Peter is given the discernment of spirits and he looks straight into him and he sees his heart. It says that his heart was poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. There was something deep going on. To everyone else, Simon had given his life to the Lord, gotten baptized and was excited about the Lord, but there was something going on deep inside him that needed to be corrected. Now, whether Simon went on and surrendered his life and turned his life completely to the Lord, um, we're not sure. But here in this story, we see that Peter is given the discernment to know what's going on inside his heart and that there is something wrong with this gentleman. And he calls him out on it. And that is a good illustration there in the book of Acts that gives us an illustration of the discerning of spirits working in the disciples' lives. Simon's motivation was for money, for power, for control. But Peter saw right through it that there was something deeper going on in his heart. We also see in Acts chapter 16 that although some may be proclaiming truth, it can be from the wrong spirit. Acts chapter 16, so let's just turn a couple pages over. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. Paul and Silas are preaching in Philippi. And, and seeing the Lord work greatly in Philippi. And it says, Now it happened as they went, uh, went to prayer that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her master, who brought her master much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days." So we read this, I don't know if you guys read this, and you say, well, what's wrong with that? Like, she's advertising for them. She's proclaiming the truth. Well, the problem is, is the source that it's coming from. It's coming from a demon. Her source of divination is demon possession. And so this demon is the one crying out. Now, we look in the Gospels, what do the demons say? They know right away, you are the Lord, you are God. Jesus says, hey, be quiet. Be quiet, it's not time to speak. Here we see this demon is crying, crying out, and Paul looks and says, I don't need it from you. That's the wrong source. That's not, that's not the source I want. And says, but Paul, greatly annoyed, I like this, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came, and he came out that very hour. But when her, <clears throat> but when her master saw their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And we... The rest of the story there, they end up in jail. And the jailer is saved, and it's, it's a beautiful story. <clears throat> but we have to be careful where the source is coming from. Here, the source of the information was coming from the wrong spirit, from an evil spirit. We look at it, we say, okay, wait a second, I, you know, whatever. This, at least she's telling the truth. At least she's speaking the truth. <laughs> But some false prophets, some false teachers will give you 90% of the truth. 
It's that other 2% that will drag you to hell. That's why sometimes when you look at someone, you'll go, well, I, I'm having a hard time finding you know, a fault in what they're saying, but I just know that there's something wrong here. I just know, I just feel that there's something wrong with the, what this guy and what he's saying or this person and what they're teaching. But we'll look and we'll read and we'll go, I just can't find anything that, that, that points it out right away. And we have to be careful about that. We have to be careful about that. And that's why we need the discerning of the Spirit so we know. We know the truth. For example, if you ask a Jehovah Witness, do you believe in Jesus, what do they say? Absolutely. You say, is Jesus the Son of God? They say, oh, sure, yes, he is. You say, you know, uh, if you believe in Jesus, are you going to go to heaven? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. They, they'll, they'll give you all the, an the right answers, but we know they don't believe in the right Jesus. He is the wrong Jesus. Because the Jesus that they're following is the Archangel Michael who doesn't have any power to redeem us at all. And we have no guarantee that we're going to get anywhere when we get to heaven if we follow what they're teaching. And that's not the Jesus that we find in the scripture. He might have the same name, but he's not the same Jesus. If you ask them, is Jesus God? That's when they get very angry and usually walk away. I remember I had a guy come to our door, who was a witness, and I opened the door. He knocked on the door, and I knew this guy because he, he lived in the same building as us when we lived in our apartment. And I opened the door, and I said, is it not correct that it says that if someone comes preaching another gospel, that I'm not even supposed to open the door to them and not even bid them good day? He said, absolutely, you're correct. You are right. And he turned around and started walking, and I went, wait a second. <laughs> you just admitted. Okay, never mind. He was already gone. But I'm like, you just admitted that you're, Okay. Hopefully that is working on him over time. <laughs> Wait a second. I just admitted I'm teaching a false gospel. It's like, yes, you just did. Um, <clears throat> okay. So we have to be careful about those things. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 and 14 says, you don't have to turn there, it's just two verses, but it says, For such, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. The enemy is able to appear as someone who's good and has the truth and is able to speak. Even if they come dressed in a nice suit to knock on the door and they talk very kindly, what they're speaking is not the truth and you have to be able to discern that. He appears as an angel of light. He deceives <clears throat> with a false tempting message. In Genesis chapter 2, we read that God told Adam and Eve that he commanded them, of every tree of the Garden of Eden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it, eat of it, you shall surely die. And then in chapter 3 of Genesis, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of, of every tree of the garden? Notice here, he says every tree. So he's testing her. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Notice that she's added now, lest you touch it. The Lord never said that. The Lord said just that you don't eat it. Then the serpent said to the woman, you, sh you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The enemy knows how to twist the scripture. The enemy knows how to twist the scripture, how to subtly twist it and turn it to drag our hearts away from the Lord. That's why this gift of discerning of spirits is, a, is vital in the church today because there's so much noise out there. there. Everybody and their dog has a blog and a video and a thing presenting all kinds of information. I remember once we, the boys had a, a friend over for sleepover and he says, you can trust everything on the internet. And I went, Whoa. <laughs> So I said, well, yes, I trust that the earth is flat. And he says, oh, what are you crazy? So I said, come with me. And I went over to the computer and I said, is the world flat? 
and it, three websites came up instantly right away that said the world is flat and I pressed play on this video that was talking about how the world is flat and that anybody who tells you it's round is crazy and he's like but but I said is that not true like is that a lie and he goes yeah that's a lie and I'm like but it's right here on the internet and I've got a whole bunch of other pages I can go to and he kind of went whoa I didn't I didn't know that and I said yeah that's why you have to be careful about what you're looking at you have to be careful what you're digging into what you're listening to because it may sound good. Those have you ever watched those videos? They've got scientists and they tell you all this stuff and they say all this, oh yeah, you know, it's the refractory of light and not, and they talk about all this stuff and, and and you can go, wow, they're really convincing. Oh yeah, they're really smart. But it's not true. I would say you just have to look up the moon at night and go, well, the moon's kind of round there, and I'm pretty sure it's not a disc, it's not it's not a plate spinning up in, in the sky. So um and the, the Bible tells us that the world is a sphere. Isaiah tells us that it is a sphere. And so we know the truth. But we have to be careful about those things because we can get caught up in them very quickly and get pulled away. 1 John, let's turn to 1 John real quick. All the way to the end of the Bible there. Well, Revelation is. Well, mine's actually charts and weights. First John chapter 5. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. There are many false prophets in the world. Jesus, we talked about last week, said over and over again, there are going to be false prophets and more as we get closer to the end. There are those that are going to speak, and we talked last week about those who smile, and they tell you everything is going to be wonderful. And we look in Jeremiah and Isaiah, and we go, hey, wait, they had prophets back then who smiled and told them everything wonderful. And Isaiah and, and Jeremiah said, no, no, things are not going to be wonderful. When, uh, when they said, you know what you need to do is put your head down, and when the Babylonians come, you go with them. You willingly go with them. And they said, oh, no, we're going to fight. Well, what happened to those who fought? They got slaughtered. They got slaughtered. Jeremiah was saying, no, look, this is what's happening. You are the nation of Israel being punished for the way they have lived, for not keeping the Sabbath. They're being punished. And so, therefore, you are going to go into, into um, exile for, for 70 years. The Lord is very straight, told them exactly how long it's going to last, where they're going to go. And they had to listen and they had to follow. And we have to be careful because there are those who uh, rise up today and say, everything's fine, everything's going to continue, everything's great, or whatever they might say. And we have to pay attention and listen. Because there's so much false information floating around today. We need this guidance of the Lord. We have the Word of God and we have the Holy Spirit who gives us gifts to discern what's going on around us. And so it's important for us to hold on to that. Let's turn back. I know we're jumping around again. Back to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 6. So here we've got... Um, We've got uh, Paul and Barnabas out on their missionary journey. And it says, Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which means son of Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulius, an intelligent man. Notice that, intelligent man. This man called for Bar uh, Bar Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimaeus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, 
withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the, the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for, for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So here we have another instance where Paul and Barnabas are traveling, and the Holy Spirit gives Paul this discernment to know that this man who's teaching this false doctrine is teaching lies. And he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And I like how it says, he looked intently upon him. He just stared at him. For the Holy Spirit showed Paul the intentions of that man's heart. With the word of God and his spirit speaking to our hearts, we can stand upon the truth. We may not always know a false prophet by what they say. For like I said, sometimes 98% of the time they're telling the truth. But we can also tell by their intentions or their actions. Because oftentimes they speak otherwise. I have known great guys who are wonderful teachers. They, I can't say there's any fault in what they teach. But when you look at their life, you say there's something wrong. There's a check there. You say there's something not right. The way they live does not reflect what they're teaching. There's something not right. And we have to be careful about that. The apostles tell us to watch out for their only interest oftentimes is our money or power or control over the people. 1 Timothy chapter 6 I don't on purposely do this so that you have to go back and forth, but it's fun. It's a good exercise. It is. First Timothy chapter six. Verse three. If anyone teaches Otherwise, and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words uh, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, from such withdraw yourself. Paul here, instructing Timothy, he says, hey, if you have anyone who's teaching otherwise, anyone who's teaching another truth, another teaching, be careful, watch out. Those that bring clever arguments, and they like to argue over words. There are those who love to argue over words. They say, oh, but the Greek, and but this. You know what I find? When someone says that to me, I go home, and I'm not a Greek or Hebrew scholar. I go home and look it up, and guess what? I can't find what they're talking about. They'll say, in the Greek it means this, and you go and look it up and go, no, it doesn't. It's pretty easy. It's pretty plain. With the technology we have today, it's pretty easy for us to go online and look up a Greek word. And we look it up and go, that word's not there. And I've had many times where people have said, this actually means this because of the Greek and this. And then you look it up and go, no, that's not what it means. Same thing is when I'm uh, preparing to teach and I find something that's kind of neat, a little neat thing, and I go, oh, that's different. And I'll look it up and I can't find anywhere to substantiate it. I don't tell you guys because I'm going, no, I can't find it. So I can't show you where it is. So I'm not going to talk about it because I'm probably going to be teaching the wrong thing. We have to be careful about that. We have to be careful about that. But there's those who like to argue about words and they, they, they like to argue clever arguments and things like that. They're just, make, they're just causing strife. They're co and it says, right, I love how it says here, um, they, they cause strife or envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds. It's useless 
We're talking about this stuff in circles and it doesn't really mean anything or there's no point to it. And so we have to be careful about that. I remember years ago, I don't know if you guys remember the Bible code. If you count the words, and you count the letters, and then you translate that into a code, you can find secret truths in the Bible. I remember people talking about it, and they were so excited about it, and I went, this just sounds weird. This just sounds a little loony. You know, it's like, I think, I think we're getting a little bit off track. I don't think God's up there going, just wait until they invent the calculator. Then they're going to know what the Bible says. It's like, just wait until they learn computer code. Then they'll know what, it's like, no, you know, God doesn't work that way. He has tr the same truth that he gave the disciples is the same truth that he's giving us today. There isn't some secret hidden code or secret hidden thing. And so we have to be careful about that. Uh, we had a... a um, one of the kids at, at Bible study pointed out a verse, and he goes, oh, you notice that verse is chapter 6, and it's verse 66, and that's, that's the, that means man, and so that verse is talking about man, and I said, that verse, that doesn't mean anything. And I was trying to be nice, but I said, that doesn't mean anything, because those verses and chapter markings were not in there when it was originally written. So there's no secret code to the numbers that are on your pages. Those numbers weren't originally there. They were put there so that we can do this. Let's turn to, because <laughs> otherwise it'd be like, churn about 50 pages over, depending on your scroll size, and we'll, we'd get completely lost and we'd be stumbling around. There's so many who believe that godliness, and I know I've talked about this a lot, but it's, it's dragged a lot of people down. Godliness is a means to gain. Godly, you know, if you're godly, you're going to have lots. You're going to have wealth. You're going to have power. You're going to have this or that. We have to be careful about those things. So when we're looking at these gifts of the Spirit, I'm hoping that as we've gone through them, we've seen that the Lord gives us these gifts to edify and build up the church, to protect us, and also to help us grow so that we can learn, so we can build each other up, so we can say, hey, you know, maybe you should stay away from that, or hey, maybe we should go here and do this, and hey, I've got a word for you. That's the exciting thing. And I think when we pray, we should say, Lord, I, I want you to give me the best gifts, but I really want discerning of spirits because today I really need to know what's going on. I really need to know what's happening around me because there's so much out there. We just need to say, Holy Spirit, show me. And when we have that check, we need to stop and say, wait a second, I need to investigate. I need to consider this and ponder this. And we have to check into it. And so it's, it's so important in our lives because it, it saves us from a lot of grief and a lot of pain. And when we ignore it, how many of you guys have ever ignored that feeling that you shouldn't do something and then afterwards you're like, wow, I can tell you exactly on what day and when I felt that I shouldn't have done that and I did it anyways and boy, it's like, Lord, I, I need more. Yes. Can you just scream a little louder? Maybe tap on my shoulder a little harder? How many of you guys have experienced this when the Holy Spirit gives you that check? And you say, hmm, yeah, there's something not, something's not floating right. Something just doesn't fit. And that's the exciting thing about the Holy Spirit. He works in just simple, subtle ways. And oftentimes he'll work and we don't even know it. And that's what I said at the very beginning when we started looking at this. A lot of the gifts of the Spirit, we don't even realize we're doing. And then we start learning about it and we go, oh, yeah, the Lord gave me that word for someone and it just came to me and I just shared it with them and it was a blessing or the Lord did this. Oh, wow, I didn't even realize that the Holy Spirit is working. I didn't even know. And I, I think I told you guys that story about the young, the young feller that was uh, doing camp. And after camp, he was... He was crying. He was in the prayer room crying, and he said, "I just, I just don't feel like the Holy Spirit's working because everybody in the sanctuary was rolling around and hooting and hollering and jumping." And he just said, "I just the Holy Spirit's not working in my life." And I said, "You led your entire cabin to the Lord, and preached to them every night at camp. The other kids were chasing kids around with water guns, and you were preaching the gospel to them. The Holy Spirit's working in you overtime." That's awesome, and you're listening to it, and he didn't even see it, didn't even know it. And oftentimes, that's how we are. We don't even know that we're doing it. And so we say, Holy Spirit, show me. I want to know. I want to do these things, and I want, to be, I want my ears to be open. 
as Jesus says over and over again in Revelation, uh, let our ears be open to what the word, the Spirit is saying to the church today. Let us have our ears open to get the Q-tip in, clean it out. And I know that after time and when we've been walking with the Lord, we can quickly get a little waxed up because we think we know what needs to be done and we're not listening to what the Holy Spirit wants to, be, wants to do in our life. And so our prayer in our heart should be, Lord, show me. Show me through your word. Show me, you know, in my walk, those things that I need to discern, those things I need to know. Give me those words of wisdom. Give me those things. I know I pray it all the time because I just want to make sure, you know, that I lead the fellowship properly and that I don't allow things in. I always use the illustration of, you know, they always had the picture of the shepherd and all the pictures of the shepherds that I saw growing up, they were kind and soft and gentle, which is true, but they always had the shepherd's crook. And I remember someone once said to me, do you know what the shepherd's crook's for? Yeah. It's for hooking the sheep, pulling them in. It's for whacking the wolves when they come around. It's like, it, it's a weapon. It's a tool. It's to take care of the, the, trouble stu- the troublesome sheep and the bad wolves that get in the way. And so I say, Lord, give us that shepherd's crook that we need sometime to know when we need to go whack, back off, get out of here, you know, scoot. And also the heart to be able to say, hey, you know what? Um, I'm going to use this discernment to bring correction to someone. Because oftentimes he'll give us a word and we'll say, hey, you know what? I just, is there something going on? And oftentimes when you do that, they'll say, oh, oh, what do you mean? I say, I just feel like they're, and they go, oh, yeah, I've been struggling with this. Because a lot of times, we, let's be honest, when we're struggling with a sin or something, we don't want to go tell everybody. It's like, I just, you know, I just hate Kevin. And I just, every time I come to church, I just want to punch him in the face. You know, and Randy, oh. It's like, but I'm not going to confess that, right? It's like, oh, but, you know, someone might say, I feel like there's something wrong because when you walked by Randy the other day, you swung at him. <laughs> I saw you clench your fists. You know, it's like, oh, okay. I'll start fisting up and Okay. <laughs> I'm just picking on you because I know you can take it. And I know I can take you in the parking lot later. <laughs> And then, and Kathy can take care of the wounds afterwards. It's really good, Kathy. It hurts. Owie, owie. Yeah. But the Lord can use these gifts in amazing ways. And so we just have to say, Lord, I just want them working in my life. And I'm hoping that as we've gone through this, that you'll see that I know from my past, there was a little bit of uh, apprehension about the gifts of the Spirit because it was always made into something weird and over the top. And it's like, okay, now next week we're going to be talking about the gift of tongues. And yes, there's some stuff in there that, that we can't explain that's a little bit weird. But I think as we go through it, we'll see that it's, it's something the Lord has given us. And it's a gift. And it's beautiful if it's used properly. But like every other gift, if it's misused, it can turn into chaos. And so Paul wrote that section that we've been reading in 1 Corinthians to correct the Corinthians. The Corinthians were super gifted in the working of the Spirit, but there was a lot of abuse going on. And so Paul wrote that to correct them. And thank the Lord he wrote that because that gives us guidance on how the Holy Spirit is to work in the fellowship and how we're to walk in it. All right, well, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. Holy Spirit, we ask right now for your gift of discerning of spirits. Oh, Lord, bring it down upon us right now. Lord, fill us with that, that we may discern the spirits working around us, the things going on that we don't always see on the outside, the stuff happening, as they say, in the back room. And Lord, I pray that you would just be working in each and every one of us. Lord, fill us with your gifts Fill us with words of wisdom and knowledge that we can share with one another. We can lift one another, encourage one another. Fill us with, with your faith, that faith to take, to take great steps and leaps of faith in our life. Lord, for your working of healings and miracles, for prophecy to be spoken as we share, declare the word of God to one another and, and, sh- and just speak your truth. 
that we proclaim it, Lord. And we ask, Lord, for this empowering that you promised us, the power to be your witnesses. Holy Spirit, we ask right now that you would come upon us afresh and anew, that we would just feel you right now working in our midst. May we draw closer and closer to you. May we be strengthened in you and be built up. Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you so much that you didn't just leave us alone, that you sent a comforter to come and to work in us and through us, to guide us and to walk with us along this road. And Lord, may we rely upon him more and more. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. O oh Lord, you're beautiful, your face is all I seek. For when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. O oh Lord, please light the fire that once burned bright and clear. Replace the lamp of my first love that burns with holy fear. O Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I seek. For when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. O oh Lord, please light the fire that once burned bright and clear. Replace the lamp of my first love that burns with holy fear. Replace the lamp of my first love that burns with holy fear. Lord, may this be the prayer of our heart, Lord. Fill us, refresh us, Lord. Fill us with your love, Lord God that we may see your face, that we may come before you, Lord. Be working in our midst this week. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.